Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Open Q Birds of a Feather here at SIGGRAPH 2019. Uh, my name is Todd Priebus. I'm a product manager at Google. I'm just going to be giving a very brief overview and then turning it over to the people that have been doing the, the real work on this, uh, both Ben Dines from Sony Imageworks, who's been working with OpenQ for close to 10 years, and Brian Cipriano, who's a software engineer at Google, who's been leading our uh, OpenQ efforts on the uh, TSC. So again, this is just going to be a very quick intro for me, but before I, I get started, I would love to get a quick show of hands. How many of you have downloaded OpenQ? Sweet. Uh, how many of you have used it on shots? Not even in production, but just used it in shots. Not as sweet. Okay. But again, this is a, you know, it, it's a very new product uh, or new uh, software offering for the Academy Software Foundation, very different from a lot of the libraries that typically have been adopted, and we understand it's going to take time to ramp up uh, and gain adoption. So again, it's just very exciting to see the progress we've made over the last year that Brian's going to talk about, um, and the fact that we have so many people here actually um, uh, engaging with us and, uh, and chatting. So um, I'm going to turn over to Ben, who's going to give a history of OpenQ from Sony Imageworks. Uh, then he'll turn it over to Brian, who's going to talk more about the, the current status, the work that was done to get it to an open source uh, product. And then uh, Brian will talk about the roadmap. And we do want to leave a lot of time at the end for Q&A uh, to get everyone's feedback on where they would like to see improvements, where they'd like to see the roadmap go, uh, and so on. So with that, again, thanks for joining. And I'll turn it over to Ben Dines from Sony Imageworks. Yeah, so to get some, started with some of the history of OpenQ, it, um, you know, these are some of the movies that it's worked on, starting all the way back at the beginning with Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs and recognized Spider-Verse and some other ones. Uh, so yeah, uh, as mentioned, um, the OpenQ started as a project called Q3. It was the third iteration of rendering queuing software that we had at ImageWorks. Uh, and it first became, or first went into use about 10 years ago. And that was on Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs was still using Q3 while it was in development. Uh, and so they were very much sort of stress testing it and, and everything else as it went along. Uh, and, and that show delivered in July of 2009. And uh, they peaked at, if you can imagine, 2,500 running cores. So many. Uh, what's interesting, though, is the first show to deliver on Q3 was not uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. It was actually GeForce, who was scheduled to deliver in May of that year, and uh, in the last three weeks before delivery, basically pulled a crazy Hail Mary and um, switched the entire show over to Q3 <laughs> from the old system, uh, at, you know, peaking at about 2,200 cores, and actually it, it worked out for them. It was a smooth landing. Uh, and so some of the more recent uh, improvements we've had have been adding cloud capability to Q3. And so uh, the, the, first, the first cloud rendering uh, that we were able to do with Q3 was in 2017. That was during Smurf's Lost Village. And, uh, and that was uh, entirely on AWS cores, and uh, it peaked around 6,500 running on that. Uh, and it was about a year later that we then added uh, GCP capability uh, Google Cloud to the um, to the to the queue and into our software that integrates everything. And on uh, Hotel Transylvania three, uh, which was the first to actually take advantage of Google Cloud processing, um, we uh, we actually peaked at about sixteen thousand running uh, running cores for um, uh, of the Google cores themselves, and that was actually still in addition to another six thousand running Amazon cores. Um, currently, uh, where we are, our, our Q3 software, um, our render farm has about 55,000 local cores in it, but uh, our peak uh, total running in our Q3 software was actually about 100,000, and that was during the Emoji Movie, uh, if you can imagine, um, in, uh, in May of 2017. Um, and that included about 40,000 Amazon cores running alongside our, uh, our on-prem cores. And uh, so that's... The gist of the history, I'll pass it on to Brian now. Hey, thanks. Uh, so yeah, so we started, uh, so we started working uh, with Sony a few years ago, uh, kind of kicking the idea around about open sourcing their uh, in-house scheduler. And things kind of went from there. So we did a, a lot of work to kind of pull out some components and, and get it ready for an open source release. Uh, we 
uh, when it first kind of arrived, it only supported Oracle. Uh, that we kind of knew that we had to support other database options uh, going forward, so we uh, added a second uh, database option in Postgres. Uh, it was also using a, a network layer called ICE that had some licensing problems, so we had to we replaced that with gRPC as well for uh, uh, for networking. And then we we did a whole bunch of other kind of code code cleanup and general prep and documentation and getting it ready for release. Uh, so that happens in, what, in January of this year. And yeah, then a few months later, it was, uh, you know, we proposed it as an ASWF project and it was accepted shortly after that. So we've been, uh, we've been doing a lot of work to kind of uh, get, it, get it going since then and, and uh, move it all over into the ASWF. So, um, and the ASWF has been great for that sort of stuff. Uh, just kind of providing like a lot of the stuff that new projects need. So, uh, you know, the whole technical steering committee structure, uh, even the process of like, you know, taking notes and checking them into your GitHub repo so other folks can, can join in later has been, has been nice to have, as well as, you know, big stuff like CI infrastructure. Um, so we have, uh, we have a bunch of folks on the, on the, on the TSC now, uh, folks from Google Cloud, uh, Sony, Netflix. Uh, we've got Matt Chambers, who wrote Q3 originally uh, <laughs> at Sony. And, um, and we've had, so we've had some pretty good momentum. We've had about, you know, you can see the stats up here. We've had a pretty steady amount of changes coming in per week. Um, you know, new, new issues being reported and bugs being fixed uh, since, uh, since it's been open sourced. And yeah, so, so, so far our development has been pretty focused on uh, the ASWF stuff. Uh, getting CI in place, like, st like stable CI in place and all that. And now we're kind of uh, turning our attention to the future. So we're kind of seeing, uh, we're, the TSC is in the process of building a roadmap, basically. And, and so we're excited to hear what folks have to say and want to see on that roadmap. Um, so I can, sh I can pull up a full draft if we have time later, but uh, the kind of main, main big things that are uh, coming up are um, Windows support. So right now there's, it's, pretty much Linux only for a lot of the components. Uh, we've got general resource limits, so that includes things like software licenses uh, that aren't taken account into the schedule uh, right now. That's been a popular request. I think that, that one is actually in, in review right now and should be out released within the next, I think, probably week or so. Uh, Built-in user management, so right now it kind of operates on a pretty open permissions model where folks can kind of you know launch jobs and access whatever jobs they want as long as they have access to the system. Uh, so, you know, that we want to build in a, a full kind of user system that uh, integrates with what you got in-house, ideally, you know, things like Active Directory and LDAP and stuff like that. And once we have the user management, uh, this opens up a whole bunch of other stuff we can do, in particular having like a fine-grained permissions model uh, for different resources within your, within your OpenQ deployment. Uh, and then we want to we want to expand a lot of the host app plugins that we have. So right now, technically, you you can run any software uh, with OpenQ. The the way that it works is you know your your job submission constructs a uh, basically what's a uh, bash command to be sent through to the render nodes uh, at the end. So any software that you are using can work, but it is not the easiest thing to do if uh, you don't have a plugin for your for your host app. We have Maya Nuke right now that. You know, basically what it does is it's a light layer that, uh, you know, talks to the, the DCC app and pre-populates a lot of the things, builds the command for you, and then, and then submits the job. So uh, we want to we do a lot of work to expand that, uh, and we'd love to have other folks, you know, contributing uh, for, the, for the apps that they'd like to see. I think Blender's pretty far at the top of our list. I think that's in, in progress. We've made some steps toward that in the last, the last few weeks. Uh, Houdini's on the list as well, and there's a whole other, uh, there's a long list of them as well. Uh, and then kind of the, the biggest bit of development work that's coming up is the, uh, a big revamp of the, of the actual scheduler within the system. Uh, right now, you know, if, if you've taken a look at the OpenQ code, uh, basically a, a, lot of the, a lot of the scheduling is done in kind of, uh, it's all database driven, so complex queries, stored procedures, that sort of thing. It's pretty hard to debug and uh, expand and maintain. So uh, we're going to be doing a, a 
big revamp of that that moves a lot of that scheduling into, uh, into memory. Uh, and this is gonna, this will open up a lot of kind of advanced features that we can add, such as, uh, you know, kind of adaptive, adaptive scheduling, customizable schedule or logic, um, stuff like that. And yeah, so that's, that's kind of what we're working on. Uh, that's what the, the high level view of the roadmap looks like. It is definitely a draft right now. And, uh, you know, we'd love to get feedback uh, from, from folks to see what, hear what they'd like to see on there. So uh, I think, yeah, we'll just kind of open it up to a, open up to a Q and A right now. And if there's, uh, you know, if anyone has any, any feedback, anything that they have seen with OpenQ so far, uh, yeah, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, not yet, but we'll publish it uh, yeah, at the end of this meeting, and then we'll, we'll be working on it. We have a TSC meeting tomorrow, actually, uh, where we'll be kind of incorporating the stuff we've, we've heard over the past few days and today, and then, yeah, we'll publish it at that point. Yeah, so I, th I would say we're about probably, it's, hard, it's a little hard to say, it's probably a month or two away from Windows support. Um, the, big, the biggest kind of problem that we ran into was the uh, uh, Python 3. We had to, you know, due to kind of lack of, uh, lack of some of the binaries that we were using for uh, particularly PySide uh, in Windows, uh, we had to kind of go through and start to convert everything to Python 3 as a, as a prerequisite to, uh, you know, unblocking that. But there is, uh, there is a lot of code in the system that already handles uh, Windows and Windows scheduling, so it's, uh, there shouldn't be a lot of work uh, after that to get it done, and it's, it doesn't really, it shouldn't really place any, any limitations on the scheduler, as far as we know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What's the optional fixing that you might have to install in our Like, uh, how ready is it to start using it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's ready now. You know, Sony Sony folks are using it uh, in, in production. We've got a few different ways that. You can deploy it. That are we have a user guide that we've published or an admin guide uh, that outlines them. It's we do publish Docker images of all the main components, uh, so you can deploy that if you're looking to. Or we also have uh, you know kind of basic build instructions as well. There's a you know a few different steps, a few, a few different components you need. Um, but yeah. Can you repeat the question? <clears throat> it, it's a combination. Um, it's uh, all sorts of different. I, I think um, mostly uh, Dell PowerEdge um, render nodes, and um, those are all connected, you know, through our our network. Um, I'm looking at a Kind of systems right there. Um, uh, it's about um, I think I think it's a 10 gig network, but um, then we have NFS mounts where all the production data is stored, and so everything accesses it through that. So it's sort of a central pool of data um, where uh, where everything reads everything else from. It's it's very network uh, based. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, mo most of the hosts are um, uh, 16 physical cores, 32 thread. Uh, I think we have some that are 20, 40. Um, oh, the, are, you're asking about the... Oh, the server side. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> what does it take to run OpenQ? Yeah. 
Okay, well, uh, it depends on the scale. Um, I, I mean, oh, for 55,000. Um, I would have to get back to you on some of the specifics. Yeah, we, we, I think, almost never have uh, server load related issues with, uh, with the queue, even with 55,000, even with 100,000. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, you know, something that we have in mind, but it's, there are enough benefits to uh, the kind of development to doing that kind of transition that uh, it's definitely worth it, but uh, the, yeah, there could, there could definitely be some in increased resource requirements as a result of that. Um, but, sorry. Right now it's basically multiple master. So because everything is kind of database focused, uh, everyone can kind of, you know, play the same role in the process. Yeah, when we change it in memory focus, it'll get a little bit more complicated where there'll probably be a single scheduling node and the others will be able to pick, pick up the work if that one drops off or, or something like that. Um, but definitely the, you know, we always want to be able to support multiple, uh, multiple servers here. Um, obviously, like, re re reliance and uh, reliability and redundancy is, is pretty important here for us. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, Greg, do you want to talk about that? Greg's mostly been working on that piece. Yeah. How's it going? I'm Greg, uh, software engineer at Google. Um, yeah, so the resource management stuff is mostly about, you know, imposing arbitrary limits on jobs, but particularly at the layer level. So OpenQ kind of has uh, three tiers of job structure. You have a, a job, which is a lar large container of multiple layers. A layer is kind of a command that's running uh, against a frame range, and then you have individual frames running each. So you can impose uh, any kind of limit you want on the uh, layer level, and basically it's just going to uh, look at how many types of uh, jobs are running with that limit, what the resources are available, and uh, do scheduling appropriately based on that. Uh, no, I, I, I think I'm following you correctly. It's more for the, the uh, first scenario you described, where basically being able to do scheduling based on license limitations is one of the main priorities of it. No, we'd love to talk about the about advanced features. Yeah, um, you know, if, if we want to chat here, or if, uh, we also have a developers list as well, um, which uh, we can we can share with you as well. That'd be a great place to start chatting about it and, and what you'd like to see in, in OpenQ. Yeah. Yeah, and there's also we also have our public TSC meeting tomorrow. Uh, if you want to, uh, we're happy to hear any any new proposals as well as there. Uh, 
Uh, well, they can probably talk a little bit more about the, the specifics of it, the Sony folks, but uh, I will say that there, there isn't too much special you need to do. You know, once uh, there's, a, there's a component that runs on each of the render nodes called RQD, uh, when, it's, when RQD starts up, it's gonna phone home back to the, uh, back to the server, back to the QBot, it's called, and those nodes will basically be, be registered and ready to go. So as long as, as long as you're on the same network as the QBot, um, then there isn't really too much, too much else that you need to do, but did you want to talk about the, the specifics at all of that? Uh, I, that covers, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that covers most of it. Yeah, in our case, you know, we, we peered our network to, let's say, Google's network uh, in order to have, you know, nice direct connection so that everything was fast. Um, but, uh, but yeah, otherwise, um, everything, the, the structure of the queue itself, the queue's infrastructure was still running exactly as it was, uh, you know, when everything is on-prem. Or, sorry, sorry. Oh, we did actually, yes, that, that's actually a good question. We, we are using preemptible, because um, it's about a quarter of the price. Um, I, I think most of them have a policy of a 24 hour automatic reboot, and that's in addition to being able to have it preempted. In our case, uh, that was implemented in the, the renderer itself. Um, we have our own version of Arnold, which uh, has the ability to sort of uh, you know, write out a, a periodic checkpoint, and so you can start in restart, stop, restart. And, uh, and so that gave us the ability to say, okay, well, as long as they can give us about you know, 30 second warning before preempting the, the host, then we can write out the temporary data and then start it again somewhere else. Um, and then, uh, which actually at that point, then the 24 hour limit was less of a big deal because that one you could at least predict. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, we, we've dealt with it, but it, that's actually happening on the software end of our renderer as opposed to uh, the actual queue itself. Uh, Domain-based, yeah. Um, we, would, uh, we had a set of scripts that would sort of scale up and down our, uh, our cloud allocation as we needed. Uh, and so it was sort of based on what the production itself would say, you know, hey, you know, we're gonna have a really busy render night, you know, let's go up to, you know, from 8,000 to 10,000 or 15,000 or something like that. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, everything was based on sort of the, the load as it was on the queue. Um, and we had, it, yeah, we had it scaling alongside that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, was those scripts separate from the process of OpenQ? Could OpenQ potentially in the future say, oh, I have a lot of jobs, I'm allowed to open up more um, on GC, uh, GCP or whatever, um, and get more render nodes? Yeah, I, if I remember those scripts were running alongside the Q software, uh, as opposed to directly inside of uh, the, the Q system itself. Um, so it was kind of more of a, outside monitoring and, and yeah, tweaking the, the settings. Yeah, the, uh, so there's no, that isn't built into OpenQ yet. It is kind of an external process, but that's definitely something that we have an, our eye on. I think it comes up, comes up a lot with folks who'd like, you know, all that data is in your scheduler already. There's no reason why you need someone making those manual decisions. So um, yeah, that's something, something that we're looking at for sure. Yeah, and also for the, uh, I wanted to say about the preemptible bit is that it is kind of reliant on the software itself to do any checkpointing right now. The, uh, the system does handle nodes disappearing very well. Uh, it's, you know, if the node gets preempted, then it's the, the system flags that pretty quickly and it gets removed from the pool. Um, so there isn't really anything special you need to do to, to deal with preemptibles. It just kind of, you know, the, the tasks will fail and the nodes will drop off and then those tasks will get requeued later. Um, and if you do have checkpointing, uh, in use with your software, then uh, you know the software will just make use of that and resume the task for you. Uh, it is sorry. <laughs> it is my understanding that OpenQ has quite a bit 
difference from Q, like you mentioned changing the network protocol, uh, maybe running Postgres in the open source version. Is Sony running OpenQ or Q, and are there plans to like keep in, uh, uh, migrating Sony to OpenQ and have that rolling with the uh, open source release? Yeah, so they're in the, they're in the process of migrating over, but uh, they soon will be fully on the OpenQ release. And all of the, it actually kind of worked out because all those components that we removed and replaced were all, all mapped pretty well to their replacements. You know, gRPC and ICE share a lot of similarities. Oracle and Postgres were, are almost entirely compatible. Uh, there were very few like code changes we actually needed to, uh, to get all that stuff working. So the, the transition process should be, uh, should be pretty smooth. We haven't really run into any, any big problems yet. Hi, uh, could you talk about some of the maybe performance edge cases, um, just in terms of uh, submitting a lot of jobs for OpenQ to consider, sort of limits around that space and what you did to kind of mitigate them, or as you move to the cloud and maybe introduce more latency and, and having hosts in sort of weird locations or things like that? Thanks. Yeah, sure. So uh, when, it, when it comes to moving to the cloud, we have, we have run into too many problems, actually. The, the kind of network demands of RQD are, are pretty low and haven't really been affected much by the, the latency involved. I think, the, uh, I think file storage, which OpenQ doesn't really touch at all, uh, is, is much more of a concern than any, anything that comes up with the, the scheduling itself or the render nodes. Um, in terms of like uh, lots of jobs, um, I don't know. Yeah, do you want to talk about that? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Do you want do you want to talk about some of the load testing you did uh, as part of the sure. last few conferences? Cool. Hi, uh, my name is Brennan Doyle. I'm a solution architect at Google. Um, so the tool is not really intended to be cloud only. Like we're trying, we have released an open source tool that can run anywhere. Uh, but as a solution architect with a background in uh, visual effects, that we've been running a lot of, um, we've been stress testing it at Google ourselves. And uh, as you mentioned, a lot of what you try to do when you're moving to the cloud is make sure that the infrastructure behind it is strong, and storage. And uh, Google has a great story around networking. We have a great story around storage as well. This is not a Google presentation. All the other clouds are doing a great job as well. Um, but uh, you would want to connect with a solution architect or someone from the cloud that you're running on to design your system. Oh, I think so. Would we, we were, we've run um, some processes primarily through Blender and running jobs. I, we've had upwards of 6,000 uh, cores running at a time like on, on our uh, scenarios. Uh, oh, oh yeah, sorry, that, that would be instances, which would be uh, somewhere between eight virtual cores and 16, depending on what we were doing. So the system should scale uh, quite well, but you will want to talk to somebody with cloud experience about like your filers and what type of networking you're using, because that's likely to be where you're going to run into uh, issues. Yeah, but uh, in terms of, we did throw, uh, you know, I think thousands of jobs and ta uh, simultaneous tasks at it at the same time. and. Um, you know, I think we've, we uncovered a few bugs in the process, but uh, once we made a few, a few small efficiency, efficiency changes, uh, things you know, handled it pretty well. So it can handle a lot of simultaneous work right now. I, I forget the exact, it's, it was thousands of, uh, of tasks running at the same time, right? It was like 10. Yeah, so we, we published some, uh, we've published some solutions around um, this that you could find on the GCP website by just looking up OpenQ and GCP. Uh, and there's like scene files that you can download and examples of how to run those. So we've done a couple of things. One is like very small jobs and a lot of them. And then the others are very big jobs and not as many. And uh, OpenQ does, it's been keeping up. So. Do you remember how, about how many? I don't, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The number I'm remembering, re remembering was about six or 8,000 at a time. Um, yeah. are, there, are there any design decisions being made to help push forward things in a, like a multi-site workflow way where different sites could actually share a single supervisor and manage the work between them and have some sort of native understanding even of things like the bandwidth between sites, how much data could actually travel ac across those tubes and just actually like manage the resources in a more holistic worldwide kind of way? 
Mm, yeah, good question. So there are kind of like two, two parts to that question, right? So it, currently, with the OpenCube does support a multi-site deployment. Uh, this is kind of you know, what, one of the benefits to this, the, the current database-driven model is you can just spin up more Qbots uh, wherever, assign them different facilities, uh, and you kind of are, are on your way. Each, each facility, uh, it's a term within OpenCube, operates independently, so it just, uh, uh, so it takes care of its own facility, and uh, you're, you're all good. So that is, that's something we'll have to maintain as we move to more in-memory approach, uh, and make, make sure that that kind of system still still works well, uh, because it's important for uh, a lot of folks who are using the system. Uh, this kind of second part is like, uh, yeah, communicating requirements between the two. Um, that is not really something that OpenQ does right now. I think a lot of that comes down to uh, file storage as well, like making sure your assets are in the right place at the right time. Uh, that is really right now outside of the OpenQ domain, but uh, it, it definitely does play into the scheduling story. Um, you know, various different requirements that need to be in place for the job to start, so uh, that's something we'll be looking at. Do you have a, excuse me, uh, just around the how, how much history you can keep in the database, you have a recommended, like, when you would actually have to move records out of the, the Postgres database, or does it seem like it scales pretty well? Um, I don't think right now that that ever really needs to happen. So there is a kind of auto archiving built in, so the database is kind of split between primary tables and history tables, and as jobs finish, they get kind of moved, uh, all their data gets kind of moved to the history table. So it's still there and accessible, but the, as the actual scheduling is running, uh, it is only working on the primary table, so it stays quite fast. So there's no, there should be no real, like, uh, you know, archiving stuff that, that has to happen right now. Yeah. Um, with regard to local rendering, could you talk a little bit about any approach that you already have to um, rendering through the same code path? So in other words, an artist wants to use their uh, local machine, but still go through the same code path. So you have all the same logging, resource management, et cetera. Is there something built in already to handle that, or is that something you'd have to develop on top of OpenQ? Uh, yeah, so I mean, you can run RQD on, on you know, your local workstation and have it re just register as a, uh, as a render node, and then it'll basically function as a, as a normal worker within the system. Uh, um, or the, that's right, yeah, there's also a, a kind of local schedule feature that's, that's uh, built into the job submission as well. So you can, you can schedule work directly to your machine as well. Um, yeah. Um, so when, an, when RQD registers a render node, uh, does it sort of introspect all of its sort of properties and then report those? So. So does that include uh, local storage as well? Yeah, so it includes, um, yeah, cores, RAM, local storage, uh, scratch storage. There are a few other fields you can, yeah. GPUs as well, yep. And that all gets kind of bundled into this host report that gets sent back to the QBot, so. Um, and then the QBot will use that to kind of break the, you know, if, if you've configured it, uh, it'll, it can break that host up into uh, different slots for work, basically, so, um, you know cores or RAM or whatever. Um, do you, is there any management of CPU affinity on Linux? Um, I don't think we do any of that right now. How often does the host connect, sends that report to the database? And how, uh -huh. often, how, how often does the scheduling work? What's the cycle, I guess, that's my question. Mm. So the uh, the report gets sent. I don't know, is it every thirty seconds? Something something like that. Yeah, I see. So so it's got this kind of fallback method. So it can be every three seconds, and then it kind of that'll fall back as it as it stops working on stuff and reports less less frequently. Um, and sorry, what was the the second part of that? Uh, the scheduling cycle, yeah. So we are finding that things get, so the scheduling cycle is pretty much running, pretty much running constantly. Um, it'll just fin finish a loop and keep working. Uh, so we were finding that even with, when we were up until the thousands of tasks, things were getting scheduled within, I don't know, a few seconds, I think, right? Yeah. But we hope to actually improve that with the, with the in-memory uh, scheduler. We think that we could do a, do a much quicker full pass of the farm and basically schedule the entire farm in a, in a single pass, um, like, like within a second. Yeah. 
know, 6,000 6, scheduled tasks in 20 seconds. Can you talk a little bit about the fair share mechanism, like how you break up the farm and how that's allocated and, and how you decide what the most important thing to get going is? Uh, yeah, Greg, are, are you, you're a little bit more familiar with, with that stuff, right? <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat the sure. question? Can you talk a little bit about the fair share mechanism, like how you break up a, a resource, like a, a render farm into multiple shows, multiple departments, and talk about how you allocate those resources across all of these essentially competing um, shows? Yeah, so um, I, basically all of those are uh, pretty much features of a job, right? And uh, the scheduler is going to look at those features and the available resources and determine whether or not uh, it will work um, on, on the resources that are available. Um, pretty much hosts are broken down into available procs. Uh, procs is not a term for processors in this case, um, but uh, it's basically a, a work slot. And uh, so, uh, you know, going to bin packing and stuff like that, that's the, the mechanism for bin packing there. Um, so is there like uh, something specific as far as the, the breakdown Well, so there? there's a bunch of different ways to do fair share, right? Like there's just one big queue and everybody's ranked in priority order or you break up your farm into loose allocations across the shows mm -hmm. or you break them up into hard allocations across the shows. Like I'm curious what the mechanism is for that. I Got it. Uh, yeah, so there's uh, actually allocations, um, and a show can subscribe to particular allocations of hosts, so allocations being a, a bucket for hosts, and uh, the show can subscribe to multiple of those allocations, and it's really up to you as far as how you want to configure your breakdown of the farm. So you can have it be just one big flat pool that's shared evenly and prioritized across everyone, or if you have, uh, you know, a certain amount of like quick jobs that you want to have scheduled uh, and have a, you know, a separate pool reserved for those, you can obviously set that up. What type of Python API, external Python API, do you have for um, OpenQ? And also, what kind of metrics and statistics can we get back for completed jobs and tasks? Yeah. So the. In terms of API, there is a, you know, there is a Python API that we publish. All of the, uh, it's part of the main, the main repository uh, that's up on GitHub. Uh, all of our, basically all of our client side tools are going through that same Python API. Uh, so the GUI uses that, uh, the submission tools use that, all the host app plugins that we have right now use that as well. Um, so there's a lot of the APIs there as well as, you know, a bunch of other kind of code samples if you, if you look at the, uh, what the existing Python components are using uh, to, to call into that API. Um, in terms of like metrics that are available, um, do, do you know more about that? A little bit, yeah. Um, so uh, based on the information that's stored in the history table, um, you'd be able to, to you know, compile all of that. There, there isn't actually, there, there's nothing built in, not in the API, for for actually putting together kind of rolled up metrics based on things like that. But I mean, I've, I've done a lot of work just um, pulling the data using, you know, the pandas and the um, data science stack and just running everything through that. And uh, that works very well. <laughs> Another Blender question. I assume you're sending to Blender instances and you're rendering in cycles. Is that what you're doing? You said you were dispatching from Blender? Um, I know some of the studios I work with, we randomly get black frames. I think somebody wrote a script at one of the studios to detect the black frames. Is there any management of bad frames at all built into the system where it automatically does that, or do we have to rely upon Python scripts and stuff like that? Yeah, I don't think there's anything like that built in right now. Yeah, it would be a, uh, though there is, you know, the, when you're submitting jobs, you can basically uh, break your job up into as many different stages as you want. So you can have a job structure that does like pre-flight, main render, some sort of post-process. So that's probably what you'd want to do is have a post-process that, that does a check for bad frames. And then you can then call into the Python API to uh, either submit a new job or, or uh, requeue uh, certain frames. Like that. So this is a kind of multi-tiered and it might be just a, the answer might be just 
hey, it's just how you configure it. But um, so for example, you have software that sometimes is licensed per user, per machine. So if you're running, you, you want to benefit from being able to use one license per machine, even though you have it broken up into multiple uh, uh, instances. Um, but then also, if you remove the user from it, then you don't know who's doing the actual job. So can you talk a little bit about how uh, you guys configure those kind of things? And then also, sorry, also permissions on the files at the end. Is that all client code, or do you have any mechanism around that? Mm, yeah, so for, mis for the permissions on the files, uh, there's not, uh, I don't think there's any management of that right now. It does the, so RQD will run as the, uh, will run as the user that submitted the job right now, yeah, is okay. how the user's model works. So uh, when it writes it out, it'll, it'll be owned by the, that user. Okay. So you would have the problem with, a software that is licensed per user that you'd be pulling multiple licenses for a single machine. Okay. And there's no way to manipulate that in the system to, to modify it going in and out of the system? I, so it's either one way or the other right now. So um, basically you could configure all your jobs to run as a single user. Yeah, generic if you user. Wanted, yeah. Uh, but uh, you can't do that on like a per job level. Okay. And there's no way going in and out like to reassign it and then going back out? Not at the, uh, like, open queue level. Yeah. Um, okay. So, RQ yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, it was more curiosity. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. I was wondering if you can, uh, from a, like, a render wrangler perspective, if you could talk about what tools you make available for job variation or exception or error handling? Uh, what, what sort of um, mechanisms do you provide for either scripts to do that or uh, sort of automatic detection? Yeah, so we do have kind of two, in the GUI there are two different sections, really. There is a kind of artist view and then there's a Wrangler view as well. And this is kind of pre-configured pre with a bunch of different tools that help make it easy to kind of drill down into different parts of the farm, see what's happening where, uh, see, you know, quickly see what kind of uh, frames might be bad or taking too much resources kind of stuff. So there are, that is kind of built into the GUI right now. Uh, the, uh, the GUI also kind of is, has a very kind of extensible plugin system. So like each panel in the GUI is, is technically a plugin that's, that's being run and it's uh, a pretty simple process to basically script up new, uh, new panels and that as well. So if there's something specific you'd like to see then uh, you know, it's a few lines of code, and you can add a panel to the, to the GUI to see that sort of thing. Hi. Um, I should like to ask about the submission API or the job descriptions. It seems to me that with a project like this, there's either going to happen by accident or intentionally a common job description format for people to submit render jobs. Can you talk about the submission API, how high or low level you're choosing to place that? Yeah, so there is, so in terms of like the job description itself, there are a few different layers. At, at its base, it does use a kind of XML description. Um, you don't really have to work with that directly. We do have a whole Python layer, so it's basically, uh, you're basically constructing Python classes that represent pieces of the job, and then the, the, the system basically handles baking that out into, into XML later. Are you Sorry, talking, you how high or low level are those sort of pieces then? Are you, are you talking run this command or are you talking do this render against this script or do this series of frames or? Right, right, so it's basically run this command. It, it passes in a full, a full command with, and there are a few different placeholders that you could put in that command, like frame number, for example, is, is the big one. Um, but yeah, there's really no, there's really no translation that's happening on the server side for that. It all gets constructed client side, uh, and that, those commands get pretty get passed through, uh, you know, almost exactly to the to the render nodes. Uh, so, that the the kind of nice thing about that is there's you know you don't really have to wait for OpenQ to support any specific software. You can just you know construct the the job description with the command that you want to run, whatever that is. You know, you can do file archiving or just whatever bash commands that are, that are available on the on those machines. Uh,
right? So we do have some kind of higher level, like kind of abstraction layers for that in our, it's called the Py Outline library, which lets you, is that Python abstraction layer. So you can kind of work at a higher level uh, in Python, but uh, yeah, that's not, not strictly necessary. Hi, I had a question about user interaction with the database and with the QBots. Um, is there any kind of concern about users interacting with the QBots to get information about their jobs while the QBots are still trying to schedule? Like, I've seen other queuing systems that will mirror that database, or maybe you spin up a separate QBot for their interaction. Right, so uh, that is one of the nice things about being able to have multiple, multiple QBots, is you can kind of, as, as load increases, you can kind of spin up more to, to deal with that. Because the scheduling runs mostly separate from the actual like API serving, uh, we haven't really seen any any problems with like API load slowing down scheduling. Uh, as long as uh, it's more about API load competing with other API calls, um, but spinning up more QBots can alleviate that. And one of the nice one of the kind of benefits of uh, of this the migrating to in memory scheduling is then we can have one QBot that basically is dedicated to scheduling and others that are dedicated to API and you know, really make sure that there's no con conflict there. Uh, I think you mentioned license management being a future thing, but I just wonder if there's any mechanisms or any thoughts about how to maximize license usage for things that are like per node. So for example, you know, you pay one license per node and then you want to be in all those jobs from that kind in that node, but without really micromanaging it, uh, which nodes have the licenses. So just wondering if there's anything there or any thoughts. Yeah, I don't, th I don't think we do per node licensing right now, is that correct? Um, yeah. Because of this kind of scheduling problems? Uh, yeah, so like um, right now RQD isn't registering like what licenses are available automatically based on uh, you know being able to collect information from the node. It would have to be configured uh, by the user for that individual node and basically that node added to a pool uh, for uh, license consumption. So. So the GUI for, um, the, the interface is all written in PySide, if, if I remember correctly? Yeah. yeah, that's right. I'm just curious, when you have like 100,000 nodes updating that table, is that, how slow does that get? Because usually people go to C++ for that instead of you relying on Python. Right, yeah, so it is, the GUI right now is not really designed to view like the entire list at once. In uh -huh. fact, it doesn't even load the, load the full list when you first open it. Oh, so you just it. don't, do that in the first yeah. place. Yeah, okay. and there's a, uh, so there's basically a search field, um, so you, so you can basically search for whatever nodes that you're looking for, and you can just put a, put a uh, star in there, in, yeah, and, okay. let, and see the full list, or you can kind of drill down. Uh, and there are, there are a few different panels for, for viewing, uh, for viewing the full farm structure as well, so, you know, uh, there's a, like, there's one tree view where you can see the breakdown per facility, and then allocation, you can, you know, view the full list for whatever bucket of nodes that you're looking for at a time as well. So, um, so you mentioned uh, Python API to communicate with the system. Is there any event-driven API like you will get notified when the job complete or here or something you could subscribe to? Uh, not at the moment, but that's coming very soon. Um, that's in development right now. Yeah. Uh, sorry, another question. <laughs> Uh, as far as metrics goes, we went to a lot of talks yesterday that people were talking about metrics, pipeline metrics, and whatnot. And uh, with Google having some machine learning frameworks, uh, I wonder if it, any thought being put there, like what metrics does OpenQ currently uh, retrieve, and uh, you know, does it do fun stuff? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we've we've been to a lot of those talks as well, and, and we're we're definitely paying attention to to what folks are asking for. Um, you know, it's, the kind of metrics collection right now is pretty basic as it stands, but we, you know, we, we kind of understand how important that stuff is. And yeah, we definitely, we definitely want to do more with that in the future. So um, question about composing the submissions itself. Like, is there, um, is there any plan to build a GUI or something wherein I can compose the submission graph and then submit it to the open queue? Or do you want to leave that to the this is the application itself to compose using the Python API. Like, what is, right. what is the plan? Right. So we do have a uh, an application right now. It's called Q Submit. Uh, it's part of in the in the main repo. It does kind of what you're looking for. Uh, you can, you know, basically add add various layers to your jobs. So you can build up some, you know, a kind of linear job structure of maybe 
pre-flight and render and comp kind of thing. It doesn't, it, right now it doesn't do the full, like the full complex tree structure that you're talking about, um, but we're definitely, we'll definitely be looking at like expanding and building on that tool in the future for, for doing that stuff. Um, Do you want to build a complex workflow wherein like you take the inputs and uh, spit the outputs from a one DCS application into the another one and you want to see everything in a single submission graph? It depends on that. So yeah, as you rightly said, it is it can be studio um, specific, but I can see general patterns for like the workflows because like all the studios try to do the same kind of workflows at, at some point. So yeah. So a step to start with that other people could extend with Yeah, basically having our having our job description come with a lot of uh, having Pi outline come with a lot of different examples for how to get started that that kind of thing. Yeah. Is there a, a language agnostic API like a RESTful endpoints for interrogating jobs? Yes. So it all so we don't have a REST API yet. That's kind of at, planned for the future. Right now, it's all going through uh, gRPC. So the the Python API is calling those gRPC endpoints. So yeah, there's no. There's no reason that needs to be Python specific. Um, exactly. Yeah, you can call gRPC directly. There's also the, um, you know, the the proto files that that get used for that communication are published along with alongside with the code, so that could get compiled into whatever whatever language you're using. Yeah. I think it's time for maybe one more, one or two more. All right. Thanks. Um, is there anything in built where you can um, tell a job at the submission time to kill itself after a certain amount of time or to retry? Is that built in or is that something that's going to be deferred to some kind of monitoring that's external? Uh, let's see. So we do have, the, we do have auto retry um, built in and configurable. Um, in terms of killing itself after a certain amount of time, that's not, that's not something I've seen. Do you guys have, have a feature like that? No, I don't think so right now. Um, just getting back to the render wrangling aspect of things, do you guys uh, have live log streaming with regular expression analysis of it to be able to do custom warnings or errors, for example? Yeah, so we have, so one of the panels in the GUI will, uh, will stream a log file of the, of the task that you have selected. And you can do, um, you can do search within that. There is a search field within that panel. I don't know exactly how complex the, like, regex uh, expressions it can handle R, or it's just doing a kind of basic search. Um, but that's the kind of thing we, we would build out in the future, yeah. In terms of like automatic uh, alerting based on what's coming from that log, uh, nothing like that right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, would, that would be a probably yeah, configured uh, you know, part of your job description, kind of have a separate process that runs and watches, watches log files. So, yeah. so in the event of like a network partition where you're where your render nodes no longer can communicate with your with your server, what, what is is there any particular behavior? If there is there like a heartbeat, do they do they shut down or do they just keep rendering happily? Um, yeah. So if they if they lose connection to the server, um, there is a regular heartbeat that happens. Um, the I'm not sure exactly what the behavior on the on the render node side is. On the server side, those nodes will be dro they'll dropped. They'll be flagged and then removed from the pool after I don't know. 30 seconds or a minute or, or something like that after it misses a few heartbeats. Um, in terms of how the, how the actual render node handles that, I, I will believe it'll kind of just keep, keep going until it finishes its current task, uh, and then it'll, it won't receive any new reports from the QBot, so uh, it'll just stop at that point. Yeah. Yes, yeah, if the heartbeat picks back up, it'll be added back in, yeah. Uh, this kind of, yeah, this kind of happens a lot in a, especially in a cloud environment when you have preemptibles coming and going and they make sure the same name or same IP address that this, this uh, will get handled fine. Yeah. 
Hi, I have a question. Um, so is there a mechanism to add in a pre-process and post-process um, mechanism into it, or are we responsible for adding that into our own scripts? Uh, so you'd configure that as part of, as another layer in your job, basically, because it's all using, you know, because it has this kind of low-level, just build a command and pass it to the render node, there's not much difference between a render itself and a pre- or post-process. Uh, so you would just kind of add that as, a, as okay. another layer. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, it is. So you can. Yeah, oh, just, we, yeah, we're being told we need to wrap it up. So, but uh, we'll all be around. Uh, so, anyone with any more questions, definitely on the more technical side, feel free to. Uh, Oh yeah, and our T we have our TSC meeting tomorrow. If if folks want to show up to that, that is posted posted on our on our website on openq.io. Um, right, uh, TSC is in room Diamond Room Three tomorrow from ten to eleven. Olympic Room Three, ten to eleven. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>